As an American soldier who volunteered to serve in Iraq, tonight is an immensely personal and intensely important debate. I spent endless hours with Iraqis, many of which I count as deep friends today. And I urge you that any debate about the future of Iraq goes well beyond any policies and plans. Ultimately, it's all about people. Men, women, and children in Iraq will deal with the ramifications of the decisions that we make. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, tonight you've heard a great deal about what's gone wrong in Iraq. I don't deny any of that. It's been well documented. Uh, Mr. Alawi, in his book, called it a catalog of errors, and I could not agree more. Uh, coalition forces have made more strategic and tactical mistakes than can be counted. On top of our failures, uh, there was the bombing of the Golden Mosque that occurred. Uh, I was in Samarra that morning and was one of three Americans uh, in the mayor's office that evening when all the Iraqi leaders and city council members came together. It soon became evident that Al-Qaeda had perpetrated the bombing in order to set off sectarian violence throughout the country. Thankfully, we know today, despite months of violence, they failed in that objective. But much has changed since I left Iraq in 2006. In fact, much has changed since everyone in this panel left Iraq. The strategy being used in 2007 and the summer of 2007 have entirely changed the security and the political framework of the country. The new strategy has brought about an extraordinary and very drastic turnaround in Iraq. Throughout Iraq, violence is down over 60% since June. In Baghdad alone, sectarian killings are down 80% since the surge. Days go by in Anbar province, the former capital of the insurgency, without an attack. And Iraqi security forces are far more competent than they were in the past. There are over 400,000 that have been trained to date. Two years ago, three were able to independently operate. Today, that number is 85. That's, that's battalions. <clears throat> and lastly, Iraqi tip lines, meaning information tip-offs, are up four times what they were last year, which is a key indicator that the Iraqi population has decided it's, it's time to turn against those that are perpetrating the violence and turn against the true occupiers, as they said to me face-to-face, uh, -face, which is Al-Qaeda and the worldview they seek to impose and the people they kill in the name of Islam. I must quickly diverge to refute two points made by previous speakers, first by Mr. Ben about the, com the composition of the Iraqi insurgency. He claims that the Sunni insurgency is purely a nationalistic defense of the Iraqi homeland. That is far too simplistic a definition. The insurgency I faced in Samarra was directed, led, and financed by Saudis, Syrians, Libyans, and others from surrounding countries. There is no doubt today that Iraq is a global stage for outside actors. And Al-Qaeda and others will use Iraqis as their own political pawns as they see fit. That is their strategy. Their sick and twisted strategy is to de destabilize, divide, and conquer. I'd also like to take on the second point about Anbar province that Rory made, saying that it was, the, it was the sheikhs and the tribal leaders that stood up and brought the peace. I agree. But what he, didn't, what he failed to mention is what happened before that, when U.S. Marines cleared Ramadi and cleared Anbar province and kicked out Al-Qaeda, allowing Iraqis, men un, not unlike Mr. Alawi, the opportunity to lead. I could not agree more. We need a man like Mr. Alawi in Iraq. But he's not there today because a suicide bomber tried to kill him in 2006. You have to provide security at the base level before you can expect the Iraqi people, courageous Iraqi politicians, to stand up and fight for their country. That's what the surge has done. That's what the current American strategy is there to do. Uh, these facts amplify even more the importance of what has occurred this year. In Sunni communities across Iraq, most not notably in Anbar province, but not only there, Al-Qaeda overplayed its hand and tribal sheikhs stood up to provide security for its population. This awakening ha has spawned salvation country councils around the, around the country. Excuse me. And their, their presence has dramatically stabilized much of the country. But it's not just in Sunni Anbar province. It's both Sunni and Shia in Diyala and in, in neighborhoods of Baghdad that have come together and formed concerned local citizens groups. Over 70,000 Iraqis have joined these in order to keep radical Shia militias and Al-Qaeda elements out of their neighborhoods. These men are not militias. They're vetted, screened, they get fingerprinting, 
they have received retinal scans, they're paid with uniforms and weapons, and they're monitored closely to ensure that they are only maintaining security for their neighborhood and not conducting offensive operations. They are members, they, and they hope to be, and will become eventually members of the Iraqi security forces. Now, all of this was made possible by the security gain, not all of it, but a great deal of it, was made possible by the security gains uh, brought about by General David Petraeus's new counterinsurgency strategy. He said, uh, the new strategy at its base level is quite simple. We're taking American forces out of the big bases, out of their Burger Kings, and we're pushing them in, in with the population out with, to protect, to live with, to, to fight for the Iraqi people. Okay? <clears throat> in doing so, insurgent forces as well as agents of sectarian violence are denied haven amongst the population. They're denied space to operate, and they're no longer able to intimidate and co-opt the local population. The relationship that's gained from this new stance uh, brings about trust, a level of trust, a level of cooperation, and ultimately intelligence, which is the crown jewel of any counterinsurgency. You, know, you have to know who the nefarious actors are before you can expect to remove them. The patrols that I walked down in the streets of Samar, the foot patrols with the Iraqi army, uh, we walked into a lot of dangerous neighborhoods. We didn't do it very often, and we should have. But when we did, I'm not kidding you, God is my witness, they were almost bona fide street parties. Men, women, and children would come out greeting us saying, where have you been? Where have you been and why have you not been protecting this population? Why have you not been protecting the interests of a government here in Samara? And uh, it's, it's a great question and one that was not answered then, but one that we are now answering by providing security with the pop for the population. Mr. Men and Mr. Stewart have said that the very presence of foreign troops incites violence and prevents independent progress. Uh, this is oftentimes the case. I do not deny that statement flatly, but it is not overwhelmingly true. And it contradicts the fact that the progress resulting now is resulting from more troops in more neighborhoods conducting more operations that are providing the, pol the space, the political space, for men like Mr. Alawi to repair this country. That is ultimately needs what needs to happen. I know, I, I'm a soldier, but I know there's no ultimate military solution to this. And I don't think anybody in, in the American military or in the milit American leadership thinks so either. However, you have to provide security at the base level. If you do not provide security, those Iraqi politicians that are so badly needed will never have the opportunity because they're not going to go out and cut somebody's heads off to achieve their objective. Al-Qaeda will, and they have. And until we deal with that problem, Iraq will not have the political space it needs. As for the later, latter portion of our motion that we must win, this assertion seems fairly straightforward to me. I don't believe anyone in this audience would assert that losing to Al-Qaeda would be beneficial. In fact, it would be a disaster. Just imagine Al-Qaeda forces storming the Iraqi parliament and beheading Iraqi politicians. Would this not empower the cause of violent Islam? And what better recruiting tool could we give them and the neighboring states this gentleman mentioned uh, in the future? Unlike anyone else on this stage, save Mr. Alawi, I've walked the streets of Iraq since the insurgency unfolded. I've entered Iraqi homes, taken off my helmet, and sat down over tea to discuss the future of Iraq. Iraqis, people like you and I, want a better life for their children. I ask you to vote for the Iraqi people, Sunni, Shia, and Kurd. May we help them win and shape a more peaceful world in the process. Thank you. Pete Hexa. Pete Hexa, ladies and gentlemen.